a question like twice. About depreciation? Yeah, Don't worry about it, that's okay. Got to catch him. Writing after the time is up. Then why why is it taking you so long? Go find him. He's the, the guy in the green jacket. Go get him. Okay, folks, get settled in. Come in and sit down. Okay, find a seat, please. Okay. So here's what's going to happen. Hey, folks. Guys. Break it up and please get in your seats. Okay, so here's what's going to happen. First, if you talk to the person next to you, you probably should realize by now that you had two different versions of the same quiz. Okay. The numbers won't match, but it's not your problem. It, this is, for those of you in my corporate finance class, I've always done this, and I always have somebody who comes up to me afterwards and says, that was so tricky. What's tricky about it? You've got a damn exam in front of you. Do your own exam. What does it matter the next person's exam? Once in a while though, and I hope this has ha hasn't happened to you, I get a perfect solution to the wrong exam. <laughs> you, that is unexplainable when that happens. So if you did that, I'd throw myself at the mercy of the court right now and beg for whatever I know. Hopefully you haven't done that. Okay? So here's what's going to happen. Right now, the exams are being sorted in alphabetical order. Okay? So when I get back at 3.15, they'll be waiting for me. And then I'll start grading. And I'll grade, and I'll grade, and I'll grade till I'm done grading. And then I'll email you saying, it's done. Come pick it up. I'm not bringing it down to class and handing it out in class. That'll be a waste of a half a class. So the exams will actually be on the ninth floor of KMEC, face down. That's why I asked you to write your name in alphabetical order. So I hope you recognize your own name because it's amazing how illegible names are. They'll be in alphabetical order. Don't browse. This is in Barnes & Noble, right? So just pick your exam. It's alphabetically sorted. You know exactly where in the alphabet your last name is. Pick your exam. I will also send you the solutions with the grading template, which I will use. So you will see exactly how I've graded the quiz, so you can check the grading, make sure it's okay. If it's not okay, bring it in to me. But you'll know when the quiz, and it'll be sooner than you think. Okay? So very quickly, I, I, you know, I don't want to pick scabs right now, but um, let's pick a few scabs off. On the first prompt, I gave you cash flow, right? I did all the work. I gave you the cash flow. I gave you the discount rates. All I wanted you to do is find the right discount rate apply on those cash flows. So what kind of cash flows were they? Cash flows 
to the firm are cash flows to equity, and how can you tell? Anna? Why were the equity cash flows? Because, I, what did I start with? Do you remember the first line of the, the cash flow statement? What was the? I started with net income. That was the first clue. And then I subtracted our debt cash flows, cash flows equity. If it's cash flows equity, what does contract should use? Cost of equity. So already cost of capital going up. What currency the cash flows are in? You're in euro. And if you decide to do your valuation in euros, your cost of equity has to be restated in euro terms. And how do you do that? You have to start with the dollar cost of equity and take out, net, net it out, take 1% off or do, I'll give you full credit either way, whether it's an approximation or full. So you use a euro, could you do everything in dollar terms? Sure, you get exactly the same answer, but then you'd have to use a dollar inflation rate and a dollar cost of equity. So that was the first problem. The second problem is, do you remember how to do risk-free rates in risky currencies? That was my point of asking you, what's the Indian rupee cost of equity? And then, can you compute equity risk premiums across regions, which was the second part of the problem. Third problem was weighting betas, right? What did I give you by, the, by, by business? I gave you revenues, but I also gave you a way of converting those revenues into value. If you use revenue weights, it's not the end of the world. I will take off a half a point because I think you had enough information to use value weights. But you need a debt to equity ratio. And it looked like there was missing information, right? I gave you the debt, but I did not give you the equity. So what else did I tell you that, that allowed you to get around that problem? I told you that it was fairly valued, so if you have the value for the company, subtracting out the debt will give you the equity. I'll wait so that at least 25% of you who just took the value of the firm and treated it as value of equity. Remember, that's the value of debt plus equity. You need to subtract our debt. Again, not, there are, there are, you know how in the Catholic Church there are cardinal sins and ordinal sins? Cardinal sins are the sins you can't go to confession for. This is it. You're, you're in purgatory, right? Okay. That's not a cardinal sin. This is, this is an ordinal sin, smaller sin, so I'll punish you accordingly. The last problem, I made a mistake while writing the problem. I left one piece of information out. And actually, it's good. I told you revenues grew at 10%. I told you operating income grew at 10%. There was this little quirk about working capital, which was mechanical. But I mentioned nothing about depreciation. 50 of you noticed that. And he said, what should I do? I'm going to give you some advice that has nothing to do with this quiz, but going forward. When I give you some room to run, make an assumption. Make a reasonable assumption. So if you used the last year's depreciation and said it's straight line depreciation, I can't tell you you're wrong because I didn't. I mean, it means your cost of goods sold must have gone up because your revenues and operating income still grew at 10%. So if you left depreciation at that value, it's okay. If you grew depreciation at 10%, that's okay too. You know what's not okay? If you said, look, he didn't tell us anything about depreciation, so I'm going to act like depreciation is zero. That is not an okay answer. Okay? That would be like my forgetting to give you an equity risk premium to compute cost of equity. Say so he forgot to give an equity risk premium, so I'm going to assume it's zero. No, that's not going to work. So if you make reasonable assumptions where there's, so don't overwrite the facts in the case, right? But if you make reasonable assumptions, that's why I grade the cases, because I am um, the exams, because my point is not to catch you on mechanical deal. You didn't use the 10%, but to make sure that you're getting the big, the big conceptual questions that drive the value, the, those numbers. So the quizzes will get graded, they will get returned, you can, and I'll give you the grade distribution. I hate actually attaching letter grades to a first quiz, but I will because I know if I don't, you will harass me, you will nag me. I got an eight and a half, what is that? Is that an A, is that an A minus, is that a B plus? So I'll give it to you, but remember it's 10% into the class and it might not even count. Why? Because if you do all three quizzes, remember your worst quiz goes away. So if you do really well in the quiz, congratulations, but don't let it get to your head. If you do really badly on the quiz, my condolences, but don't let it get you down, it's just one quiz. Okay. So wait for the scores to come, so don't start emailing me this evening saying I made this mistake, can you take that into account? I'm, this evening I'm not looking at emails, I'm grading. So, you know. so once the grading is done, if you have an issue, I will always, so it looks like I'm crying. I'm not. 
<laughs> you should be crying, I shouldn't. You know? <laughs> I actually, my allergies are kicking in. I almost wore my dark glasses and my sunglasses in, but I look like, I don't know, a little off kilter teasing. So I'm going to act like I'm crying. Okay? So let's pick up where we left off. You know? Let's forget the quiz. Okay? You remember the notion of a sunk cost from capital budgeting? What's a sunk cost? Something that's already happened. This is a sunk cost. The first quiz, don't obsess about it for the rest of the class. Kind of let it go. Now let's talk about completing the picture on growth. We talked about what it is that drives growth for a company, and it's a function of answering two questions. How much are you reinvesting? How well are you reinvesting? We looked at it in the context of earnings per share, where we measured how much you reinvest with the retention ratio and how well you reinvest with the return equity. We did in the context of, 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 of non-cash net income, where we measured how much you reinvest with an equity reinvestment rate, the percentage you put back in the business, and how well you reinvest with a non-cash return equity. And we measured growth in operating income by looking at how much you reinvest overall and what your return on capital is. There's one you know, glimmer of hope that you might have to increase your growth rate, and this is if you can improve your return on capital as a company. And here's why. When you can improve your return on capital as a company from 5% to 10% or 10 to 15%, what you get is a bump in the growth rate at least for the year in which you get the improvement. It's a purely mathematical effect. So I'll, I'll show you how this works with a real company. In 1999, when I was valuing all my you know, tech companies as part of my first edition of the Dark Side Evaluation, one of the companies I was valuing was Motorola. Remember that I gave you the numbers for Motorola? Not bad reinvestment, not bad return on capital, not bad times, not bad gives you not bad growth rate. But in my valuation, I assumed that Motorola's return on capital, which was 12.18%, would over the next five years improve to about 17%. So it's going to improve by about 5%. So over the next five years, not only are they reinvesting money, but on top of that, they're improving their return on capital on their existing assets. So here's what it does. If you take the first term in the equation, that's my return on capital times reinvestment rate, the standard equation. The second term in the equation is the growth rate I'm going to get each year because I'm improving the return on capital. And very simply put, here's what I'm doing. If you think about the improvement I'm getting, I'm getting about a 5% improvement on a 12% return on capital. So roughly speaking, it's about a 40% growth rate over five years. I'm looking at the compounding effect of that, and the compounding effect of that gives me an additional 7% of growth every year for the next five years. So I get a 9% growth, that's just the first term every year from the reinvestment in new projects, but I also get an additional 7% each year because I'm improving my return on capital every year. So if you're valuing a company with a low return on capital, before you give up on the company, this might be one reason why that company might be able to grow much faster than just multiplying the reinvestment rate and the return on capital is because it can improve its return on capital. So let's see if you, if you get the concept of growth. I'm going to show you an example with five companies. I have a very simple task for you. These companies are all growing at exactly the same rate. They're all growing at 10%. So if you look at the bottom line, their operating income is growing 10%, but they're getting there very differently. So your task as I go through these five companies is to tell me which of these five companies has the most valuable growth and which one is, so rank them from most valuable to least valuable. Okay? So the first company has a return on capital of 50% and a reinvestment rate of 20%, 50 times 20 is 10. Second company has a return on capital of 10, reinvestment rate of 100%, 10%. Third company has a reinvestment rate of 200%, return on capital of 5%, 10%. The fourth company, if you look at its reinvestment times return on capital, is only a 2% growth rate, but they're also improving their return on capital next year from 10 to 10.8%. That adds another 8%, so that's 10%. And the last company is reinvesting nothing, but it's improving its return on capital from 10 to 11%. Think about it. Mathematically, we go from a $10 income to $11 income. That's a 10% growth rate. So they're getting it done. So let's start with the easy one. Which of these companies has the least valuable growth? In fact, the cost of capital for all of these companies is 10%. Which of these companies has the least valuable growth? Which one do you? Firm three. And what does firm three do that makes it so unattractive? It's growing at 10%. That's good, right? Yeah, but it reinvests a lot more than it should. And then the return on investment is It's not just low. It's lower than the cost of capital. This is a company that, while it's growing, is going to destroy value. 
So it's going to have a 10% growth rate, but because it's earning only 5% on its projects, on its cost of capital is 10%, it's destroying value as it grows. So when you put in this growth into a discounted cash flow model, this company is actually going to get less valuable the more it tries to grow. You think, who'd be stupid enough to do this? Two-thirds of all companies globally last year earned a return on capital less than the cost of capital. Two out of three. This is 20-something thousand companies around the world earned a return on capital lower than the cost of capital. Firm three is the rule, not the exception. More companies destroy value from growth than adding value. So firm three is the worst. What's the next worst? What about firm two? What is it doing? It's growing, but it's earning a return on capital equal to its cost of capital, which means you're basically running in place. There's no value created. So right above firm, it's not as bad as firm three, but right above firm three is firm two. Now firm five is very interesting. You're getting growth without reinvesting, but the downside is you get growth only for one year. And after the year, your growth is going to go back to 0%. So it's nice when it lasts, but it's not going to last very long. So I put firm five as number three on the list. So firm three is the worst, firm two is the second worst, firm five is just a one-year growth rate. And already you can see the other two. Firm four, it's not bad, no? because it's getting a 2% growth rate, but it's earning the, co the cost capital. But basically, its efficiency growth is also going to last one, one year. Firm one is the undisputed winner. Why? Because it's growing and it's growing by taking great projects. That's why Coca-Cola is such a valuable company. You remember, it reinvests very little, right? 8% reinvestment rate, but a 63% return on equity. It gets a 5% growth rate, but it's all gravy. It's almost like you're getting growth without reinvesting, and the value is going to reflect that. So then when you look at your company or look at any company, it's easy to get drawn, distracted by the growth rate of the company. It's a high growth rate, you're impressed. But before you get too impressed, compute these numbers. How much are they reinvesting? How well are they reinvesting? Because that's going to tell you whether the growth is adding value, doing nothing for value, or destroying value. Any questions on growth? So now let's look at the most expansive way of thinking about growth. For those of you who are valuing money losing companies, none of those approaches that I've described so far is going to work for you. You know why? If you have a money losing company, what's your return on capital going to be? It's going to be a negative number. You can do all the algebra you want with a negative number, but you can't get to positive territory. So when you have a money losing company, you have no choice but to move up the income statement. Why? Because you want to find a positive number, right? And what's the only positive number you're guaranteed to get in an income statement? Revenue. So you keep climbing until you hit revenues. Desperation time. So you start with revenues, and you grow the revenues first. So when I valued SNAP last week, I couldn't start with the return on capital times reinvestment rate. What return on capital? The return on capital is a gigantic negative number. The reinvestment rate is a gigantic negative number. You might view this as very convenient. Gigantic negative number sometimes gigantic negative number is a gigantic positive number. But it doesn't quite work, because putting a positive number on a, neg on a loss will just make it bigger. So I start with revenues. You grow revenues. To what number? You've got to make sense. That's where the story comes in. What do you think about the company? What market is it going after? What do I think the market share will be? So you start with revenue growth. So you get the revenues. Your operating margin right now, if you're a money-losing company, is negative, right? So for this to become a valuable company, what has to happen to the operating margin? It's got to become positive. That's saying, you know, it's simplistic, but essentially you need a target operating margin towards which you will march over the next five, seven, eight, ten years. In the case of SNAP, you know what their existing operating margin is? A minus 96%. They're almost losing their revenues as operating losses. But when I valued them, at the end of the period, I gave them a 25% margin. Where did I get that? I looked at Facebook, I looked at Google. Essentially, I gave the margins closer to Google than to Facebook. Facebook's margins are 40%, I left Snap at 25%, because I don't think Snap can be Facebook in terms of the power of pricing. So the margins improve. So now you have revenues growing, your margins go from negative to positive. You're almost there, right? Because as your net margins go from negative to positive, you now have operating income. Net out tax, and then you get to the reinvestment phase, and you have to figure out how much they will reinvest. And this is both intuitive and mathematical. 
the one number that drives reinvestment here is not the income, but the revenues. To grow your revenues, you have to reinvest. So to estimate how much you're gonna reinvest, I'm gonna come up with a ratio called the sales to capital ratio. What I do is I take the revenues and divide by invested capital, and intuitively the question I'm asking, for every dollar that I invest, how many dollars of revenues will I get? The more efficient you are, the more revenues you can get per dollar of investment. A little later in this class, I'm gonna value Uber. And Uber has a very light capital intense model. You know why? They don't own the cars. They don't hire the drivers. So to grow in a city, what do they have to do? They have to hire a guy, give him a hotel room, and say, hey, grow the business. And he goes out and signs up drivers. The drivers bring their own cars. It's a low capital intensity model. That comes with its own share of limitations. But when I valued Uber, I gave them $5 of revenues for every dollar of capital invested. I also value Tesla. It's also a young growth company, lots of potential. But it's not going to be able to get $5 of revenues for every dollar of capital invested because ultimately it's an automobile company. It needs to build assembly lines. Those assembly lines are going to cost money. So the sales to capital ratio for Tesla is going to be much lower, which means for every dollar invested you get less. So this becomes my metric for how much will you have to reinvest. And then I'll have to stop and make sure I've built a company that actually makes sense. So I'll give you a test you can run. So let's take an example. I'll take you to my Tesla valuation in July of 2015 and take you through the process of how I estimated my cash flows. I won't do the full valuation, but I'll give you a window into how I approach this. At the time that I valued Tesla, I had $2 billion in revenues and was losing money, minus $22 million in operating income. So the first thing I had to do is figure out what its revenues would be five years out, 10 years out. And what's that going to depend on? First, it's going to depend on what business I think Tesla is in. That sounds like a strange question. What business is Tesla in? Even Elon Musk seems, sounds a little confused, right? I used to think it was in the automobile business, and its big business was electric cars. The last earnings report, what did, he, what did Elon Musk say it was in? You put, put up your hand. It's a different business. I don't believe him for a second. You know why? There isn't enough business there. The margins are not there. It's one of my problems with Tesla, is if you're the CEO of a company, you can't keep changing your story about what you are. And this case is a shifting target. So when I valued in July of 2015, I did value it as a high-end automobile company. I might have to revisit this valuation and give you a different valuation now that he claims he's in the storage business, the power business, who knows what business. And the revenues I gave them were about $79.5 billion by the time I got to year 10. How did I get the 79.5? I looked at Volvo and Audi and looked at what their revenues were because I needed to get a sense of how much are revenues going to be for a big automobile company because I can see what the revenues are now. And one of the things that you need to develop in valuation is perspective. And it doesn't come now. You have to work at it. What do I mean by perspective? I ask you, take with your company, whatever company you're valuing. You're, you are valuing a company, right? Remember the company you picked? Right? And I ask you, how, you know, what's, what does a big company look like in your business? And right now you say, I have no idea. You need to get a sense. What's big in your, in this case, I'm targeting as in a high-end autom automobile company, 79.5 billion revenues. And the way I got there, was I used to 65% compounded revenue growth for the first five years and then scaled it down as the company got bigger. You're saying, why 65, why not? Because ultimately what I care about is the revenues that I get at your, not the, so if you want to use 72 in year one and 69, you want to get fancy with the growth rates, go ahead, you can do it. As long as you end up with revenues of roughly 80 billion year 10, our valuations are going to be pretty much the same. So small revenues have become big revenues. Their operating margin right now is minus 1.08%. In steady state, I gave them a 12% margin, which is in the 75th percentile of pre-tax operating margins for automobile companies. The story I'm telling for Tesla is not Elon Musk's story now. It's an electric car company that is going to become a very successful high-end automobile company with margins which are very high by automobile company standards. I'm telling a pretty optimistic story in here. But those margins, as they improve, my losses become profits. This is what I mean by storytelling. Without a story, you cannot value a company like Tesla. You need to tell me what you see this company doing in the future. And if your answer is, I don't know, I don't know either. 
You have to make your best judgment and that's what investing is about. Elon Musk doesn't know. What makes you think you're going to know sitting there with a spreadsheet that you're going to know what the revenues are going to be next year? Make your best judgment given what you think about the company. And what I've effectively done is I've converted this company from being a small money losing company to a big money making company. Now let's complete the process. So my revenues and margins have been grown out. I now compute the reinvestment each year. So what I've done here is I've taken the change in revenues every year. Okay, so in year one, for instance, my revenues increased by 1.3 billion. Year two is 2.2 billion. And the sales to capital ratio that I've used to get my reinvestment each year is 1.55. You're saying, where did that come from? That's actually the sales to capital ratio for a typical automobile company. I'm assuming they will have to invest like an automobile company, build assembly plants like an automobile company. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they can use that Fremont plant to pump out a you know, million cars. I don't think they can. But essentially, the assumption I'm making is they will have to reinvest. So the way I get the reinvestment each year is I take the change in revenues each year and divide by 1.55. That's it. So in year one, dividing 1.3 by 1.55 gives me a reinvestment of 844 million. What's in there? CapEx, depreciation, working capital changes, acquisitions, R&D. Why am I lumping it all up? Because I have no idea what they will have to reinvest in. After I put up the SNAP valuation, the SNAP, does anybody, did anybody look at the SNAP valuation? Sales to cap ratio I used was two, which is higher than Facebook sales to cap, but it reflects the fact that there's an economy of scale as you go on. And one of the questions I got was, how do you know what SNAP will be reinvesting? And I said, I don't know. I don't think Evan Spiegel does. But let's face it, they will have to reinvest. That I know. We didn't know when Facebook, Facebook went public what it had to reinvest in. Has Facebook reinvested a lot in the last five years? It's done at least two things, which are huge reinvestments. One was early in the process when Mark Zuckerberg worked from a dream and he said, I want a picture company. And he bought Instagram for a billion. But that was like penny change because a few months later, who else did he buy? He bought WhatsApp for 19 billion. Those, are ac those acquisitions are CapEx. You're saying, how come you didn't forecast that when you did the Facebook IPO valuation? Because I didn't know. Mark Zuckerberg didn't know. You have to make your best judgments as you go along. In this case, that's what the reinvestment is. It's a capturing of So now I have everything I need. I have the after-tax operating income each year. I subtract out the reinvestment. I get the free cash flow to the firm. Take a look at that column. What do you see for the next nine years? Negative cash flows. This is called cash burn. Young companies, this is a feature, not a bug. Why am I burning through so much cash? Because I'm trying to grow fast. And what does it mean when you have a negative free cash flow? What am I assuming Tesla will have to do every year for the next nine years? They don't have ob enough operating cash flow, obviously. They'll have to go out and raise capital. Latest earnings report. What's the thing Tesla announced to the market? They will probably have to go to the market to raise more capital. And people are shocked. Really? Why are you shocked? Of course they'll have to raise capital. This happens any time you're an ambitious growth company because to fund that growth, you will have to raise capital. And I'm capturing that effect in the free cash flow. So my cash flow, even though I start making money technically in year one, I don't actually start making cash flows till I get to year 10. I have negative cash flows. And I also keep track of how much invested capital I have in the company. Let me explain how I do that. Existing invested capital is book debt plus book equity minus exactly the way I do return invested capital, book debt plus book equity minus cash. Right now it's a 1.45 billion. Every time I make a reinvestment, we might not think of it this way, I'm actually adding to my invested capital. So every year I add the reinvestment and keep track of what the invested capital I have in this company is. So why? You're going to see in a minute why it's going to help you. I have my after-tax operating income based on my margin assumptions, right? I have my invested capital based on my reinvestment assumptions. I divide the after-tax operating income by the invested capital. I come up with what I call an imputed return on capital. This is the return on capital that I'm assuming based on my growth margins. I look at that number, 12.15%. I can live with that. As opposed to what? If I got a return on capital of 121% in year 10, I know I have a problem. I'm not reinvesting enough. If I get a return on capital of 1.21% in year 10, I'm reinvesting too much. I need to scale down. Every valuation, you're actually getting feedback from your own model about whether your valuation is working or not. 
And that's one of the numbers that's useful to keep track of. One final point. I start making money in year one, year, but I don't seem to be paying any taxes in year one, year two. How come? Aren't you supposed to pay taxes every time you make money? Because I have losses that I'm carrying forward, so basically I keep track of those losses. And in fact, I don't start paying my full taxes till I get to year, year six, and year five, I'm sorry, year five. Because basically what happens is I have enough net operating losses from previous years kind of bailing me in. So when you value young companies, it becomes a little more involved because you've got to start with revenues and work done. But it also gives you a lot more freedom to expand your stories. So what would be different about, I'll, I'll leave you to think about what would be different if you listen to Elon Musk at the last earnings report and said, you know what, I've made a mistake. This is really an automobile company. It's an energy company. Think about what's going to be different. My, big, my total market is potentially much bigger, right? So my revenues could be much larger. But what else is going to change? Do you think I can make 12% margins in the energy business? No way, it's a commodity business. My margins are going to be much smaller. My reinvestment is now going to take the form of building battery factories all over the place. It's a different business. Will I get a higher value? I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's a good idea to be an energy business, to be quite honest. It's a very commoditized business where you get thin margins, slim margins, and that's why you need to tell the whole story. You can't just push the revenue growth up saying it's an energy company. Okay. Any questions on growth? So let's pull together all the different strands on growth to kind of bring them all in one place. So when I ask you to estimate the growth for a company, you can look at the past, historical growth. Remember all the caveats. You can look at what analysts are estimating, but remember they're not very good at forecasting growth, or you can use fundamentals. I've kind of given away my biases. When I think about growth, I always go to the fundamentals, which means I either use that reinvestment rate times return on capital. If you're a stable company, I might give you an efficiency boost. If you're a company boosting efficiency, or I might do a top-down growth if you're a young company where I'm not sure what's going to happen to your margins over time. So when you look at my Excel spreadsheets, they're actually designed around these different ways of thinking about growth. I let you override my growth rate and use a forecasted growth. But remember, this is your most critical input in your company, and you can't turn it over to somebody else. You can't let managers tell you, analysts tell you what the growth rate is, because then it's not your valuation anymore. So let's talk about the last big number in valuation. Value of a company is the present value of its expected cash flows over its lifetime, right? So if I wrote this out as an equation, it's just a cash flow number that goes on forever. You can't estimate cash flows forever. So that's why in almost all of valuation, the refrain here is, can I stop now? How about right now? How about right now? Because you want to stop. You can't keep doing cash flows year seven, year eight, year nine. When you think about terminal value, it's how we put closure on valuation. We stop after year five or seven because we're tired, we're exhausted, we don't want to do it anymore. And we put a number and say, that's the value of the company at the end of five or seven years. So that's what the terminal value is there for, is to allow you to finish your valuation because without a terminal value, you'd be doing this for in perpetuity, just estimating cash flows year after. And the spreadsheet, as I said, that never ends. So let's think about ways of estimating the terminal value. There are three ways in which you will see people estimating terminal value. And one of these ways should never be used, but it gets used all the time. Okay. Here are the three ways, and I'm going to ask you which one should never be used in a minute. The first is to assume a liquidation value. What's a liquidation value? At the end of year 10, you shut the company down, you sell off the assets as whatever people pay for them, and you estimate a liquidation value. You put that as your terminal value. The second approach is you take the EBIT or EBITDA or net income or earnings or something in your 10, and you apply a multiple to it. Where do you get the multiple? By looking at what other companies trade at right now. So you say, my company will trade at eight times EBITDA at the end of your 10, because that's what companies in the sector trade at. And the third approach is to assume that your cash flows will grow at a constant rate forever, beyond your five or 10. What does that buy you? It buys you an infinite series in mathematics, which then gives you a way of computing the terminal value. Liquidation value, a multiple of earnings or book value, or a perpetual growth model. Which one of these three approaches should never be used if you're doing a discounted cash flow model? You don't think liquidation value makes sense? Well, it's a cash flow. If you're a private business, let's say you own a restaurant with a 10-year lease. Doesn't it make more sense for me at the end of 10 years to shut your restaurant down than keep it going forever? Yeah, 
which would be your, you know, the oven there, the French oven you bought for 30,000. But because isn't that what you're going to do if your lease runs out? Well, you're assuming you can renew it. What if you're in a part of town where no, no, but the renewal will cost you three, three times? I, it's a liquidation. You could argue maybe it's too conservative for my company because I can renew it, but there's nothing inherently wrong in a, from a discounted cash flow perspective saying, at the end of year 10, I'm going to liquidate. So liquidation value is actually a cash flow. Well, tell me what's wrong with it, because if any of you are going to go work for investment banks, which I know many of you dream is your, is, is your dream job. No, I'm trying to make this a nightmare job if need be. No. If you go to work for an investment bank, I guarantee you this is the way they do valuation. In fact, it's in the manual. You get to your 10, you apply a multiple. So I want you to be prepared to argue with your managing director. Actually, don't do it, because you, you're getting paid pretty well. So argue with yourself and say, the guy is stupid, he's wrong, and then you know, go into the bathroom, talk to the mirror, you know, and then come back. You know. What's wrong with, with doing a... It's a pricing, exactly. What you've done is you've made your discounted cash flow valuation into a pricing. I call these relative valuations in drag. You see the drag component is, you got the cash flows up in front, you're fooling me about what you're really doing, and then while I'm distracted, you slip in eight times EBITDA, and there you go, you're off to the races. If you're going to do a pricing, just do a damn pricing. If you want to do a discarded cash flow evaluation, don't make the biggest number in your DCF into a pricing. So start preparing those arguments, because this is, I think, the most badly done part of valuations on banking is every banking valuation I see uses a multiple. So when you turn in your DCF mid-semester, I will accept all kinds of modeling spreadsheets. The one thing I will not accept is use a multiple on the terminal value. I'm going to kick the DCF back to you and say, do a DCF and then I'll look at it because this doesn't look like a DCF to me. Okay? So let's talk about that term because it, you know, the liquidation value, you're right, it's a very, very narrow way. I use it usually to value private companies, small private companies, where I think that the end is probably more likely to be liquidation. Most public companies, it is true, it makes more sense to assume growth forever. So when you ask people why they don't want to use it, it scares them. Forever is such a long time. And if you look at the equation for the terminal value, the equation for the terminal value is actually the cash flow in your 11 or your 15 divided by R minus G. You see why this scares people? So you got the cash flow in the numerator, you got the discount rate minus the growth rate in the denominator, right? So you come up with the value, it's too low. You go to the growth rate and you nudge it upwards. What's gonna to happen to your terminal value? It's gonna go up, you nudge it furthermore going to go up. You're getting excited. You can make your value any number you want. You keep pushing it. And before you know it, it's becoming a Buzz Lightyear valuation. Now I call it a Buzz Lightyear valuation. As G moves towards R, what happens to the terminal value? It's to infinity and beyond. Right? You're exploring places you don't want to go because that's exactly what happens when you play with the growth rate. You had a question. You could back out from your multiple in implied growth rate, but I'm going to ask you where you got the multiple. And if you got the multiple, we're looking at other companies trading in the marketplace today. You can get a multiple using this perpetual growth model, but the reality is if you're willing to use a perpetual growth model to get a multiple, you might as well use the perpetual growth model to get the terminal value. Most of the time, in fact, let me take that back, all of the time when I see people using a multiple, it's by looking at what companies traded in the sector. It's got nothing to do with... So mathematically, you're right. I can convert any multiple into a growth rate and say, is that the growth rate you wanted to use? But it's meaningless if the multiple itself is coming from looking at other companies trading in the marketplace. So I'm going to close with this part about the growth rate because that scares people. I've kind of mentioned this before. But remember, this is a growth rate forever, right? And because it's a growth rate forever, it cannot be greater than the growth rate of the economy in which you operate. That's mathematically impossible. You're saying it should be domestic or global? I'm going to let you make that judgment. If it's a global company, it could be the global growth rate. But it cannot be greater than that growth rate because if you let it become greater than that growth rate, your valuation is going to kind of explode. 
And then the big question becomes, well, how do I come up with that number? In the US, let's say you're doing evaluation. It's not even in the US. If you're doing evaluation in US dollars, and you got to year 10 of your valuation, and you're assuming a growth rate forever. We've talked about this a little bit. That growth rate should be capped at what? What do we say was a good proxy for the growth rate of the economy? We did this in the context of risk-free rates. That the risk-free rate itself is actually a good proxy for the nominal growth rate of the economy. And here's why. Remember I broke down the risk-free rate into expected inflation and an expected real interest rate? So when you use a risk-free rate of 2.5%, you're building in the presumption that expected inflation plus an expected real interest rate is 2.5%. So when you get to your terminal value, cap your growth. It's an incredibly convenient cap because it's right there. So all I'm going to do when you send me your DCF is I'm going to look at your risk-free rate. I'm going to look at your growth rate forever. If your growth rate forever is higher than your risk-free rate, I'm going to ask you to reconsider. And you're welcome not to reconsider, but I would strongly suggest, at least in the context of this class, that you do reconsider. You say, what if it's just a little bit higher than the risk free rate? It's like being a little bit pregnant. It, it's a, this is not one of those things you can get away with. It's just a little mistake. This is, you know, it's a zero one proposition. You've just violated the rule. It, it, the rule is, you know, it's, it's there for a reason. So keep that in mind when you think about growth rates. And, and one final point, can the growth rate forever be negative? Sure, mathematically you can make your company have a minus 5% growth rate forever, in which case your company will disappear over time, which is not unreasonable. If I'm valuing a JC penny, I'm gonna put a minus 5% growth rate forever to basically make the company disappear. More realistic than assuming a 2% growth forever. So when we come back on Wednesday, we will complete the rest of this process of filling in terminal value. Did a bottom-up beta, yep. but it falls outside the confidence interval I would get from the regression beta. It doesn't. No. Regression betas are so messed up. It's <laughs> That's what I figured. But <laughs> my second question was about the question I emailed you about with equity and waiting. Um, because That's a good question. I, th I think the key thing to remember is when you think about business risk, it's based on how much the value of the business in the new right. space. When you borrow money, money is fungible. You're borrowing money in the U.S., right? right? But the debt doesn't have to stay in the U.S. Money goes into a pot. Do you see what so I'm saying? So I guess when I read in the U.S. operations, I was thinking in, in terms of in an entity that holds yeah, but the U.S. You operations. Think of Apple, right? They borrowed $100 billion in the U.S. Once they borrowed the money, yeah. you have no way of tracing how that money gets invested anywhere, right? right? So the debt decision is more for taxes. You borrow in a particular location, yeah. but... It's not stuck with that location. It's kind of across the company. So I was making like a structural. You, you think like an accountant. You're creating an accounting balance sheet for. So I'm saying that's true. From an accounting perspective, the debt might all show up in your U.S. subsidiary, but from a finance perspective, the fact it's like you borrowing money against your house and investing it in your business, right? So if I did a house balance sheet, the debt will all look like it's in a house, but you're actually using the the cash you're getting from the debt to run yeah. your business. So. Uh, money is fungible, and because of that, I would not make it equity by country. I would just make it business by country, and then do the debt to equity on the overall business. Theoretically, if you had a business that had an had a certain entity structure, where like you had an entity that held the U.S. operations and an entity that held, if they were independent, see, it would never. If this were a company, it's just one company, you yeah. kind of it's it, it's pure accounting, right? Because the, the the entities are not standalone entities with their own boards of directors. So the, it's the, what you see at the entity level is an accounting fiction. It would be different if the subsidiaries were standalone companies that actually traded. So if I had Coca-Cola Mexico traded as a separate company and it borrows money, it stays with Coca-Cola Mexico, right? So unless you're willing to make the subsidiaries standalone independent companies, it really doesn't matter where you borrow the money, it goes to the whole company. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Professor, just a quick yes. question about something on the project. Yep. I'm doing it on Daimler. Mm -hmm. They have a small arm, about 15% of revenues that are financial services. Right. But there's no clear definition of it. It's some financing for cars as well as some ride-sharing app. And when I'm applying the EV to sales method, forgetting my bottom-up beta, the EV to sales for financial services is about 31, which weights the beta heavily yeah. towards what a financial services yeah, I just, company. Yeah, I, so I would, I would take... Uh, I would, uh, 
I would take the EV to sales if the automobile companies just put in the plant okay. service as well. Okay. It's just, otherwise, it makes no sense. Okay. So, Thank yeah. you. I had a question about the operating margin point that you mentioned, like you're yeah. essentially using that. Is there any way to account for like geographies in that? Because you mentioned Tesla, and like if they move into clean, clean technology or energy, aren't the margins like drastically different? It's not geography. It's business. That's what I'm saying. The story for Tesla, it's an energy company. The margin is not going to be 12%. You can't separate your margin part of the story from the overall story. That's an automobile, a high-end automobile margin. It goes with my story with being a high-end automobile company. But like, if they're producing at like such a large scale, like they're apparently like doubling the battery capacity. Doesn't matter, right? It's uh, your margin, so yeah, because it's not just you. It's economies of scale. So if in fact that'll show up as lower costs around, and then you're going to have to ask, you know, who's going to cut prices first? So that's not specific to them. And I, you know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. Um, just to clarify, yeah. why do you say that Tesla doesn't really pay taxes until year five? Because they have net operating losses they carry forward. But isn't it only until, because the, the EBIT times one minus is actually less?